minutes, whatever you want to do, uh, you can uh, share that with us during your offering. And we're having uh, a youth night here on April 2nd, that's Palm Sunday at 6 p.m. So come hang out with some of the youth in our district and help them get to know Wesley. And finally, uh, this Sunday, not this Sunday, on a Sunday, March 26th, uh, we're doing Wesley on tour at Jonesbury United Methodist at 1045. So we're going to carpool from here at 945. So we're going to come to that at 945. We're having lunch out afterwards. So on Wesley, so when we get lunch out, so come hang out with us. That's all I've got. And any announcements from the floor tonight? Yeah. Um, I'm just going to add on to the camp phase thing. That if you can't make it for the full day or anything, you're more than welcome just to come for a little spurt. That's what I'm going to do. Um, I'll be yeah. there at the beginning, but I will have to leave a little bit early. Um, but yeah, just be ready to come. Work, like you said. Absolutely. Thank you, Brady.
collector was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. And all who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus so stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. Lights on out here so everybody can say I want us to do something here in just a moment with this white marble board. Now it looks like there is a message already here on the podium. 
Someone who has greatly great work habits and we notice the ways in which they go about the thing. Whose was that? Anybody know? Let's go to the next page. It can maybe be a little bit easier to hide than other sins. Also, it's universal. It dates all the way back to the book of Genesis when Cain killed Abel out of envy. Anybody remember that? Well, there's message that he has been somebody's envy. Somebody spoke on envy. All right. So this evening I want to, uh, to share something very, very dear to my heart, and that is to talk about not camp, but to talk about my relationship with, with my Lord. And I want to share with you some things that the Lord has done in my life because I want to encourage you for what God has already done in my life because I know that these things that God will, has done in my life, I'm convinced, there's no doubt, that the Lord will do things also in yours. And here's the way it started for me, or one of the places where it started. Do we have anybody in here who's a sophomore? Any sophomores? We have one. Maybe juniors. One junior, a couple of juniors. Maybe junior. All right, so between my sophomore and junior year in college, I met a, a man whose name was Jerry Russell. And uh, Jerry was the uh, chaplain at Hiawassee College, which does no longer exist. And uh, Jerry comes up to me one day and says, Jeff, what are you gonna do this summer? And I didn't really have a clue what I was gonna do this summer. I was looking for some kind of summer job. And uh, he said, why don't you go with me on a mission trip this summer to Bolivia? Now Bolivia, when I was growing up, that's one of those places that when you go to church on Sunday or Wednesday, and a speaker comes in, and they talk about uh, giving your life to the Lord, and sometimes the Lord will make you or have you uh, give everything you have and move off to some place like Bolivia and stay. Well, that's the, the only thing I knew about Bolivia. I had no idea where it even was, but Jerry said, this summer, I'm going to be taking several groups on mission trips to Bolivia, and I need someone to stay down there while these groups come and go. Would you be interested in leaving in July and coming back perhaps in uh, uh, September-ish? So I didn't know what to say except that was a great invitation. And I thought, I'll just do it. So I never had a passport before. So I applied for a passport, took all my shots, uh, typhoid, yellow fever, tetanus, all these different shots I had to get. And before you knew it, um, I was working at Camp Wesley Woods for just a while. And then I got on an airplane and flew to Miami, got on another airplane and flew into Caracas, Venezuela, got on another airplane and flew from Caracas to uh, uh, La Paz, Bolivia. Now, La Paz, Bolivia, the airport, I get this, the airport, if I remember, I may got it, might get it exactly right. But the airport itself is like at, at like 12,000 feet sea level. And Miami is at what feet sea level? Yeah. Like zero. It's a very, very uh, runoff ocean there. So we climb up and we land in the La Paz Airport, which is around 12,000 feet. And I wasn't used to that high altitude. Now, I've never been up to 12,000 feet in elevation before ever. So there was in, in La Paz, Jerry and I get off the airplane with our first group. We um, were going to travel from La Paz down to the jungle of the Amazon Basin and set up our mission for the summer in a place called Yukumo, which is on the Rio Colorado River in the, uh, the headwaters of the Amazon. So there we show up. There's no electricity. There's no running water except for a river. And we stay in these little grass huts. I mean, just everything you can imagine of a missionary journey to South America, we had it. Mosquitoes, bad water that gives you stomach problems, uh, monkeys, uh, it's just the crazy big, huge snakes that will kill you and eat you and drag you off into the jungle. So we had all of that. This was like a missionary, perfect example of a missionary. So here we are. And I stayed down there uh, for about two months and I would go back into La Paz every once in a while, get a new group, bring them in, take the group back to the airport, La Paz. We did that for, for three different groups. 
Now, I fell in love with Bolivia. Absolutely loved it. I knew no Spanish whatsoever except Bono, which is what? That's right, Bono. Then I learned some other Spanish words to help me get along there. And it got to the point where I was there all summer that I would dream in Spanish. It was craziness. Couldn't speak a word of it, but I sure did listen to a lot of it. So by the end of the summer, I hop back on the airplane, and I go back and finish my junior and senior year in, in college. And then I go back and uh, work at Wesley Woods <laughs> after I graduated from, from college. Now, I met my wife in college, and we got married. Or I, 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 I met my girlfriend in college, then I got married. That, that's oh. the way it worked. <laughs> and uh, you wouldn't believe where we went on our honeymoon. We went to Bolivia. <laughs> I took that woman to Bolivia. Our ride from La Paz, we went over the Andes Mountains, up to about uh, 16,000 feet, and down into the jungle, and stayed for three weeks in Bolivia. And we stayed in the in the attic of the missionary's little grass hut. That's crazy. That's crazy. And we're still married. <laughs> <laughs> The next year was our one-year anniversary. Guess where we spent our one-year anniversary? Bolivia. While we were there, the missionary sat down with Joy and I and said, I'm getting ready to retire in a few years. Would you consider, would you consider thinking about, once you graduate from college and all, would you consider you and Joy moving down here and taking this mission outpost under your belt for us? Well, she and I thought about it. We thought about it long and hard. We really, really, really wanted to do it. And uh, at the same time, I was sensing this call in the misery, I mean ministry, <laughs> into, the, into the misery ministry, and uh, ended up instead going off to cemetery, seminary, <laughs> and uh, went to uh, Asbury Seminary, <coughs> and Asbury College, and, uh, and then we ended up going into the ministry here in the States instead. The reason I'm telling you all this is this. All it took is one person in a happenstance asking me what I consider to do something. And it changed my life. Went to Bolivia for three different summers. It also occurred to me uh, one year that I was looking for a summer job after I graduated college. I was going to graduate and uh, I didn't have a plan. And someone set up a little table in the cafeteria at our college at Tennessee Wesleyan. And on this little table was some staff member who I don't even remember there from Camp Wesley Woods. And I was walking through getting my lunch and all that. And this person said, hey, 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 you, you, come here a minute. So I went over there and they said, what are you going to do this summer? I said, I don't have a clue. I'm getting ready to graduate. And he said, would you consider working at Camp West of the Woods. And I saw the tray. I said, oh, sure. How do I apply? And uh, I graduated like a week later and then went off to work at Camp West of the Woods. And I was at Camp West of the Woods for two years and then, uh, of course, went on to seminary and all that. And then um, the rest is history. We coming back here to be the director at Camp Base Mountain. Again, the reason I'm telling you all these stories is this. It just took one one person asking me one question and it set my life in a different trajectory. That's all it takes is just that one person, that one question. So here we read in the Bible the story about a guy named Zacchaeus who was just minding his own business. He was a tax collector. No one likes tax collectors. Do you like tax collectors? One of these days you're going to be Pew. I passed Pew the other day. I thought of you. I thought, well, she's going to be working over there in that big building dealing with taxes and all that stuff. I'm all sad. That's right. Was <laughs> and um, this guy was just minding his own business. And he hears about this guy named Jesus. He says, I don't know who he is. So the scripture that just read to us said that uh, Jesus was just walking through town. And in fact, let me, let me share with you this one phrase. I thought it was really interesting. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Everyone say passing through. Passing through. 
Passion fruit. He was just a passion fruit. He was a plan on staying. He was just going after his town. Zacchaeus was in the right place at the right time. And he heard about Jesus and said, I don't know who this guy is. So he was kind of short. And he wanted to see Jesus. So he climbed up in a tree. And while he's on, in this tree, these, on these tree limbs, Jesus comes passing through. Now hold that image just for a moment. When I was at Tennessee Wesleyan College, um, I graduated in 1986. President Ronald Reagan came to Tennessee Wesleyan College. And uh, Ronald Reagan spoke out in front of the courthouse, which is nearby the college, and I wanted to see him. And I get there. This is a true story. I'm not making this up. But I remember the story about Zacchaeus and said, I want to see the president, but I can't. There's a crowd. I climbed up in a dogwood tree and got to listen to President Ronald Reagan right in front of me. And I remember Zacchaeus. Ronald Reagan was just passing through. Jesus was just passing through. And Zacchaeus and Jesus saw each other. And does anybody know what the first thing that Jesus said to Zacchaeus, the first time they ever met, what's the first thing Jesus says to Zacchaeus? Anybody know? Doesn't it come down from the tree? Yeah. Come down. <laughs> Your time in that tree has expired. Come on down. And his life was changed. He came down. And then the story goes on with Zacchaeus that um, when he goes home, his friends and, and other people around him begin to mutter. What does it mean to mutter? Anybody know what it means to mutter? Yeah, I was talking bad about him. And instead of Zacchaeus turning to them in... Um, and fussing at them or trying to correct them, he, he, he ignored them. But here's what Zacchaeus says. I think it's so, so significant. Zacchaeus stood up and said to, not the crowd, said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. If I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. Who has really good handwriting? Anyone have good handwriting? Come on. Grab your book. <laughs> Just grab your marker. It doesn't matter what color it is. Over there on that board, write it kind of over on the left side, kind of big so we can see it. Write the word here and the word now. Bigger, That's perfect right there. Here. Go to, to go no 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 no. Get rid of the hand. Now go below the word here and put now. Zacchaeus says, or Jesus says to Zacchaeus, come down from out the tree. They go to his house. They have a meal together. And then something very significant happens. It involves place and time. Place and time. Here and now. That's, that's a deciding factor. Here, right here in this place, and now, right now at this time, things are going to be different with me, Jesus. So what does he what does he do? Look here. Here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. Now, do you know what Jesus' response was? He took those two words and he said, because of those two words, here and now, place and time, here and now, salvation has come. To this house. That's what he said. That's Jesus' reaction to Zacchaeus wanting to change his life. And it happened by chance. It wasn't planned. 
He just had it. Now, Jerry Russell at Hawassi just came to me one day and said, would you consider going to Bolivia with me for two months? A staff member at Tennessee Wesleyan College at lunch said, would you consider working at Camp Wesley Woods this summer? I wasn't planning on it. I just happened to be there. Right place at the right time. And someone gave me an invitation. Now, Emory did a great job writing right there. Is there someone else that has a great hand writing? Maddie, you got your hand? Okay, come on up then. I want you to take a black marker or the um, brown one, either one doesn't matter. And uh, over here on the right side of this board, I'm going to have you write different things. Don't write different things. Got it? I'm going to give you words to write, but don't write different things. Got it? Got it. Good. All right. It's just going to be a second. Just a second. Just, just, just hang on. I'm going to read you an article that I've been holding on to. to hide. <laughs> this is an uh, article that I just received that I wanted to, um, to, uh, to, to refer to tonight. The title of it is Loneliness and Lack of Social Interaction Affecting Teens' Mental Health. Do you want me a psychology type majors in here? There you go. <laughs> you shouldn't be hiding from a psychology major. Youth mental health has been in decline for several years and was uh, increased by COVID-19 to the point that the U.S. Surgeon General issued an advisory about the youth mental health crisis in December. Two driving forces behind this crisis are, would anybody like to take a guess what the two driving forces between loneliness with teens are these days? What do you think they are? A little bit lack of social interaction. That's number one. I was thinking. Yeah, just go up there and put, put uh, lack of social interaction up there. Anywhere up there you want. What's another one you think? Social media phones. That is social media uh, abuse is one. <laughs> well, you find your number. Yeah, I know. Okay, just, just as quick as you can. We have social media abuse. Okay. And then the third one here is loneliness. Those are the factors. As she keeps writing, I'm going to read this rest of this to you here. The results from Harvard Graduate School of Education said in a uh, December 2022 survey, 61% of young people ages 18 to 25, anybody here between 18 to 25? Wow, that's about everybody. Except for Caleb and I. 61% of young people ages 18 to 25 reported feeling lonely frequently. Uh, the uh, a, a interview in Psychology Today says that loneliness has created too much self-awareness because of the lack of real relationships. The increase in isolation and a lack of social feedback has increased self-critical hyper-awareness. That's deep stuff. L-I-N-E-S-S. You're good. This creates an environment where teens are too vulnerable to be negatively impacted by social media and the influence those platforms have. These dynamics directly feed into the depression and anxiety loop that we see. That's from psychology today. So when I read that, that really disturbed me. Because a lot of the folks that I work with are young people. And if this is true, a lot of the folks that I work with are lonely. And they have a lack of social interactions. And maybe some social media based abuse. Social media So if that's true, I'm wondering what is it that camp can give campers? I've got your list. Number one. Anyway, it doesn't matter where. Okay. Write the word adventure. Trying to go. Adventure. You're so good, Maddie. I'm trying. Camp <laughs> offers adventure for our for our, uh, our little campers. Another thing that camp offers is uh, Christian discipleship. 
There are a lot of campers who come to camp because they have a desire to grow in their Christian faith. Here's a third thing that I think that, uh, that camp offers. It, it, it offers children the opportunity to, uh, to have critical thinking. In other words, they can come to camp and our ministering residents, our counselor, our activity directors can give them opportunities to grow and to think critically. Here's another one. Independence. Did any of y'all ever go to summer camp? Anybody? Woo! Some summer campers. Yeah. Some of you did. Uh, summer camp for me when I was a kid, it offered me one of my first opportunities to be independent from my mom and dad for a week. A whole week. I was without my mom and dad. And I had to be independent. We had a camper this summer who was his first time at, at, at sleepaway camp. He's been there for uh, a week, I guess. And uh, he's his first time away from his mom and dad. Mama picks him up, takes him home. About 30 minutes down the road, she gives me a phone call. Hey, Jeff, I want to let you know about this. <coughs> about you, Mike. I said, what about it? She said, he needed something in his suitcase, so I stopped along the side of the road and looked to get something out of the suitcase. His toothpaste is still in the cardboard container. His toothbrush was never put out of the plastic wrap. <laughs> His underwear, he's, he's a camp five no, no. his underwear was never changed. He was wearing the same clothes that I dropped him off on Sunday to pick him up here on the And she goes through this whole list, and I'm thinking, oh, no. She said, I just want to let you know that I loved it for him. Oh. <laughs> because this is the first time he's been independent. He got to make all those choices on his own. He'll be back. This summer, I don't make a brush with teeth. Five, number five, communications. Campers have an opportunity to be together in their cabin at night, talking. So sometimes two or three o'clock in the morning, on a hike, on a canoe trip, on the climbing tower. They're learning how to communicate, working together toward a goal. Working oh, together okay. toward a goal. Sorry. Is another thing that kids do camp. Especially on Monday afternoons, all of our campers get to go to the challenge course and operate as a team. Here's a couple more. Resilience. <laughs> R-E-S period. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough for now, Maddie. That's good for now. Okay, cool. All right, resilience. <laughs> Let me tell you what resilience is all about. We have campers who are third graders. Sometimes we have campers that are even in high school, juniors, that come to our camp. And the first day, first night, they're up in their bunk crying. We're homesick. They want to go home. And they beg their counselors, please, please let me call my mom. Let me call my dad. And what we do at our camp is we say, the only way you can do that is to talk to Jeff. And Jeff is not at camp tonight. He's at home. So in the morning, if you're not feeling good, we can find Jeff. Well, that counselor calls me and says, don't show up to camp until about 10 o'clock. Because we don't want the camper to see you. And that camper just keeps pushing through. And then I'll see that camper around lunchtime, and they'll make eye contact with me, and I run. <laughs> so day two is now finished. It, it, that you, and what we have happened have happened is that the, by the end, by, by Friday, a lot of our campers who are homesick on Sunday and Monday are crying again. But guess why they're crying on Friday? What do you think, Matt? Don't go home. Don't go home. It's been life changing for them. That's resilience. And that happens at sleepaway camp. So those are just some of the reasons, and I call those intangibles. These are intangibles for campers. But here's the deal. In Luke chapter 19, Zacchaeus, who just had a, just a happenstance run in with Jesus, he said, I'm going to do something 
to not waste my life. Jesus, I don't want to waste my life anymore. I've been cheating people. I'm a corrupt person. I don't want to do it anymore. I want to change my life. So here and now, time and place, I'm going to make a change. And he says, I don't want to waste my life. So I'm here tonight to say to you, you have one chance with this life that you've got. And I hope that you're not going to waste it. Just don't waste your life. Don't look back one of these days and look back and say, man, I have wasted my life. So how can I help you with that? Here's what I'm going to help you with. I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to present a consideration to you. This just happenstances that I'm here tonight talking about summer camp. And what are you going to do with your summer? What are some reasons why you would want to work at camp? First of all, you're interested in the money. Yeah. you got to have money. If you work at our camp for nine weeks this summer, and your salary range is going to be somewhere between $350, $400 a week, by the end of the summer, you're going to have $3,500. Bucks. Minus taxes, of course. We're going to give that to the accountants. Yeah. $3,500. And here's what I have found. I have found that uh, camp staff who work for us versus working at a fast food restaurant, for example, end up at the end of the summer having more money in their pocket than they would have if they worked at a, a place 40 hours a week at minimum wage. They have more money because you don't have any expenses. We're going to pay you two weeks of staff training. You get paid for doing that. You get off every weekend. Woo. Friday afternoon until Sunday afternoon, you're off. How about that? The whole 4th of July week, what are you? Off. off. If you want to be a lifeguard, we're going to pay for your training. First aid CPR, we're paying for it. If you want, if you want to learn how to belay on our climbing tower and at, at, on our own, uh, our uh, uh, climbing camp, we're going to teach you how to do that. Archery, we're going to get you certified, we're not certified, we're going to get you trained in archery, kayak, and canoe training, if that's what you want to do. A lot of folks have indoor jobs behind a desk. This summer, you have an opportunity to have an outdoor job outside all summer long. You get to go swimming every day. How about that? Your food and your lodging is free. Yeah. What other job are you going to give you? Three food and lodging. Some of you, this is what, why you wouldn't work at camp. It's because um, what you do at summer camp this summer will impact a child's life forever. I'm going to tell you about one here in just a moment. You'll also get to work with about 20 other young staff members about your age. <coughs> You'll be there all summer together. We're going to be flexible if you need a week off. Or a day off to go do something, we're going to be flexible for that. And then in the summer, if everything goes well, we're going to give you a summer in the, in the summer bonus. Um, and it's a great resource, or I'm sorry, great resume builder. Great resume builder. And you get to be mentored by our leadership staff to grow in your own Christian faith journey. So what are you going to do this summer? There's nothing wrong with working Chick-fil-A. Nothing wrong about working on the lobby. Nothing wrong about doing that sort of thing. But if you want to make an impact where your life is going to impact younger people, there's no other place better than summer camp. I'm going to close with this little story. This past summer, I had a really rough summer. I, hurt, I got hurt here in, right before staff training and was in a brace all summer long in my arm. And I had to rely on our staff to do everything because I couldn't do anything. I, I could point and grunt, but I couldn't do much. So one thing I could do is I could be at the gate at the camp every Sunday and welcome the parents and the campers at the gate. And I was doing that. And one of our board members came down and was doing that with me, and she said, uh, Aubrey is so excited about coming to camp. I said, why is that? She said, well, I've been telling you that Aubrey and her brother are coming, uh, and, and, and they're both deaf. I could feel the blood come out of my face because I thought to myself, I forgot. 
I've not prepared our staff that there are two kids who are coming to camp this week that you are deaf. I thought, oh, no, I'm so embarrassed. This is going to be awful. So I got on the radio and started talking and trying to maneuver things around and just alerting people that we have this happening right now. They're on their way right this minute. And they showed up. And we got them into their cabins. And uh, throughout the week, they were enjoying camp. All of a sudden, our camp started having little notepads that people would pass around so they could write notes back and forth to Aubrey and her brother and the rest of the staff. And one of the most wonderful things that I experienced was Raina was up there leading worship. And I remember, I don't know if it was before worship or I don't remember exactly when, but Aubrey, the little girl who's deaf, she comes up and she puts her hand on Raina's guitar. Why does she do that? She gets a little vibration. She gets a little vibration. She knew the songs that we were singing and she could feel the vibrations. And she could sing. Well, she, she, she could sing. And that just uh, made my heart just explode. By the end of the week, um, it was time for them to go home. And when she got to the car, her and her brother got to the car with her, her mom, they go home. Um, one of them sits on one side of mom, one on the other at the couch when they get home. And they start sharing about summer camp and how summer camp changed their life. And this coming summer, not only is Aubrey and her brother, but I think two other of their siblings, who all were adopted this summer are all going to come to summer. <coughs> if you want to be a part of something like that that's going to make a difference in somebody's life, summer camp is for you. So the question is going to go back here to this. Here and now, what are you going to do with your one good, holy, wonderful life? What are you going to do with it? I want to pray for you and then give you an action step. Let, let's pray. Oh God, I'm so glad that camps exist. Where we can learn about you. Where lives can be changed, enriched because of the relationship we have. I thank you so much for our staff that have been with us in all these years. The ones that uh, will be with us this summer. I already am thankful for them. And I pray that you will already preparing them for a life of service this summer. I pray for our campers that are coming excited. And they cannot wait for one of those uh, counselors to, uh, to breathe the word of God into their lives. Thank you, Jesus, for summer camp. In your name I pray. Amen. If you're interested in working at summer camp, Jordan Gobble is right back over here. Jordan has a staff brochure for all of you. It has all the details about working at camp. And if you have any questions about summer camp, Dylan, raise your hand, Dylan, Ethan, raise your hand, Ethan, Emery, raise your hand, Emily, Raina, Raina, and um, Maddie just left. They've all been working at our camp. Uh, you can ask them questions about working at camp as well. Tonight might be the night where you or make a good decision here and now. I want to do something with my life. Caleb, thank you for having me come up here and uh, yak for a while tonight <laughs> and uh, talk about what the Lord has done for me and what the Lord can do in these other people's lives. So, thank
God, we pray now that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast in his heavenly name. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. 